One megawatt of power can be used to support 2,500 European homes, or it could be used to charge and top up one Class 8 semi truck in the Tesla Semi. Yes, you heard that correct. According to the latest spec sheet released by Tesla for the upcoming Tesla Semi, this truck can charge using a one megawatt mega charger and top itself up in about one hour to an 80% charge. And yes, that is the equivalent amount of charging power that 2,500 homes typically need throughout one year. And obviously this raises a massive question. Can there be enough charging infrastructure to support the insane amount of power these heavy duty trucks will need in the future? Well, unfortunately, that is simply not the case right now. There is simply way too much investment needed to charge a Tesla semi, which could be hindering the adoption of battery electric trucks overall. And that concern is exactly what I want to discuss in this video. But as usual, guys, before you get into it, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. So to start things off, let's understand the specifications of probably the most hotly anticipated class eight product in the world right now, which is a Tesla semi. This product has a range of around 500 miles with a battery that is of a size of 1000 kilowatt hours. Now to put that into perspective, the Tesla Model S P90D has a 90 kilowatt hour battery, meaning the Tesla semi has almost a 10 X capacity compared to the highest performance Tesla Model S. That means that charging this thing at a regular Tesla supercharger would take more than three hours to top up at good conditions. And obviously, since time is money in the trucking industry, that is simply unviable for this kind of product. And so guess what Tesla is doing? They're launching a mega charger solution, which is essentially a beefed up supercharger for AC to DC conversion of power. And with a one megawatt charging capacity for these nearly rolled out chargers, there is significant concern about the electric gates ability to handle this kind of throughput. And if you really want to replace hundreds of thousands of class A trucks on US roads, you're going to need hundreds of gigawatts worth of charging capacity. And right now, most Tesla superchargers only have around 500 to 1000 kilowatts of energy at its peak. And because most class A trucks are not charged or refueled overnight, there is significant concern that during the day, this could really cause more damage to the electric grid than benefit from a renewable energy standpoint. Because guess what? All the extra power that could be needed to charge all these trucks at the same time will probably need to come from something called a peaker plant. And right now in the US, peaker plants are basically massive natural gas and cold fired plants that are used to essentially support the electric grid when there's a peak demand situation. And it has been known for decades that peaker plants are some of the dirtiest facilities in the world when it comes to carbon emissions, even higher than any oil or natural gas processing facility. And this problem obviously stems from the fact that renewable energy is simply not up there right now to be able to support most use cases. Renewable energy right now is only useful for those very specific energy use cases where you have a whole system in place for cycle usage, energy consumption, and demand. But when you have a very complex electric grid where you have many stakeholders working and demanding energy at the same time, that's where you can't use renewable energy effectively because it is simply intermittent. And yeah, even though you can invest in infrastructure that could help support the electric grid, the cost of doing that is simply way too high and would completely undo all the benefits that electric vehicles are supposed to bring to the decarbonization race. To add 20 million light duty EVs on US roads by 2030, you're going to need an estimated 45 to $75 billion investment in robust energy generation. And to put that into perspective, right now we have roughly 105 automobiles in the US, which are obviously mostly gas powered. And so just imagine if we go into a situation where gas cars are completely banned from sale and the only option people have are electric vehicles powered by batteries. And that could lead to way too much investment needed upfront, which is going to hinder the adoption of the technology as a whole. And remember how I said that the Tesla mega charger is designed to charge the Tesla semis in 30 minutes to around a 70% range using one megawatts of power. Well, it's estimated that getting to around five megawatts of a connection to the grid can take up to eight years to build and cost tens of millions of dollars. 
And this is clearly the biggest problem that is holding back fleets and customers from investing in electric vehicles in the first place. Because it turns out the lead time for building their charging infrastructure is longer than getting the delivery of their trucks. And this is a problem simply most people don't realize in the investment community. This requires a solution from a policy and regulatory perspective, not from a technology perspective. And you need incentives from the government if they really want to reach their decarbonization goals by the timelines they have set. Because right now, that trajectory is way too far out. And this right here is where hydrogen fuel cell technology really starts to shine. Yes, the infrastructure right now is not there for most consumers, but that is the way this is designed to be because hydrogen is a very flammable fuel, just like gasoline. And so it's not like folks fuel up their gasoline cars at home. They still need to invest in an infrastructure and assume that gas stations are nearby. And that is a very similar situation with hydrogen. Hydrogen helps alleviate a lot of these stresses from the grid, meaning you can perform the same actions that an electric vehicle platform will provide while not having to actually leverage the massively stringent and regulated electric grid. Meaning you don't need to necessarily build charging stations at your fleet. You can simply outsource the hydrogen fuel, just like most gas stations do for their gasoline. That gasoline in your gas station comes from an external supplier, an oil business who is refining that and all of a sudden supplying you that gasoline because obviously there's demand on it from your end. And because hydrogen is also a fuel, it can be transported in trucks and submitted to any customer that needs it at the right time. And because of hydrogen's insanely high energy density, not only are you saving weight on your payload, but you also have a ridiculously fast refueling time, which often can be supported by existing infrastructure like natural gas. And guess what is the most developed industry in the world with one of the biggest corporations, Aramco being the expertise in? oil and gas. And that is exactly why hydrogen could be the key critical buffer between electricity and the fossil fuel industry, which is where the class A truck industry is going to benefit massively. And you don't just need to take my word for it. Sandy Monroe himself did an explanation on this exact topic just a few weeks ago, where he understood and broke down exactly why fuel cells might make more sense for the long haul class A market in the US. Okay, so um, there is range anxiety when you get to truckers. They, uh, you know, they they need to move from here to there, and they need to, they need to do it in a hurry. Um, and then there's the other thing: um, batteries weigh a lot, and the more batteries I have, the less load I can carry. So if you're talking to a long hauler, what's lighter? Um, a couple of tubes of um, hydrogen. That, that, and a fuel cell or more battery packs. And what, what it comes right down to is that there is a crossover point there, just like what you saw with the Valley of Death. Uh, the crossover point happens when you start looking at continuous runs for more than three, 400 miles, 300 miles for sure. And that is where, that's where the, the big truck guys are gonna be looking for um, something that is going to give them that long range. And I know Nicola was thrown under the bus and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I drove their truck, um, and I it, it drives really nice. It, it works really well. Um, and the thing that it's got over everybody else's range, it's got a lot more range than everyone else. And it's faster to um, eject. <clears throat> you can eject all those canisters in no time flat and pop in new canisters and that's truckers are very interested in getting from point a to point b as quickly as they can so they can get another load and go somewhere else i mean we've tried everything in the i i don't know if you knew it but i have worked in the truck industry for a long long time as well heavy class a trucks and um we've tried everything this is where a fuel cell does shine it, it works out just fine for this kind of an application for long haul trucks the short haul trucks don't need it. Just you just the, have the batteries. You don't need it. Um, long haul, mm, the truckers are going to want that. They're they're going to demand it. Actually, yeah. uh, what do you think would drive them to move from switch from diesel to hydrogen? Would it be the the, the economics? They're ready of it? to do it now. No, they're ready to do it now. All right. Nobody wants the stink. No one wants the uh, the diesel fuel. Um, no one uh, actually. Um, one of the things I do know, and I'm not sure if it's published, publicized or whatever, but 
um, on the Oxnard docks in Los Angeles or in around <clears throat> Los Angeles, there's a whole bunch of Nikola trucks out there. And if you go near the docks, you can see miles of trucks, miles of trucks. And they're all sitting there idling because it's too damn hot to open your window and just turn off. So you've got them idling. And then you've got the Nikola trucks just sitting there. They're not making any pollution. They Everybody inside the cab is still nice and cool, on and on and on. Now, I don't know if they're publicizing that or not, but I went down to have a look. And uh, if you're in California and you need a day trip or something and you want to go and see, just go down and have a look at the docks. And, and have a look at how much shit is going into the air. I'm telling you, you can hardly breathe in that neighborhood. Well, there you go. Sandy has clearly explained how there is no one-fits-all strategy in the Class A trucking market. With the insane amount of ranges in the different types of trucks and applications, you're going to need certain technologies for certain applications and certain ones for where there's more trickier restrictions like in the long haul area. And with so much investment still yet to be done to support megawatt scale charging for especially electric trucks, hydrogen fuel cells could play that amazing buffer in the middle as we transition to a renewable electric grid, not only for the trucking industry, but also on the back end for controlling renewable supply. And with hydrogen right now being the only cost effective way to store energy over long durations of time, it is simply the most promising technology I am currently seeing for the long haul class 8 market. But obviously guys, that is just my opinion, so let me know your take down in the comment section below.